All right, listen, our Republican National Convention just ended. I want to talk about our possible new vice president, who the f*** he is, if you don't know. I'm going to give you a quick crash course. Listen, all you know about him right now might be that he has an extremely, extremely punchable face. <laughs> like, legendarily. Le is that Photoshop? Nah. Nah, 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 nah. This is totally normal. This is J.D. Vance, and right now he is the vice president on Donald Trump's ticket, which means, based on the odds, he is likely to be the vice president of the United States. And so, a little understanding on who he is. And I'm gonna let him tell it in his own words a little bit about what he thinks about Donald Trump, the man he is now the vice president of. I'm a never Trump guy. I never liked him. As somebody who doesn't like Trump, I might have to hold my nose and vote for Hillary Clinton. We're always talking about voting for Hillary in 2016. On Twitter, Vance called Trump, quote, reprehensible, an idiot, and Vance loves Mitt Romney. Those are the tweets they could find, but what's funny is like, he didn't delete his, he deleted his old tweets. He didn't delete his likes. He's got so many likes on posts that are calling Donald Trump like a sexual assaulter. Things that you can't just change your mind on for policy. Not a Trump guy at all. He gets famous, born in uh, Ohio. His mom is addicted to drugs and their parents divorce and he's raised by his grandparents and they teach him strong family values. He grows up, he joins the Marine Corps, he gets a degree from Yale and becomes basically a tech guy, hedge fund guy. That's like his his story and saga. He does a lot of writing about you know a, a path for the future of the country and the ways he sees the country could be better. He starts writing a book about serious policy discussions that could help solve America's opiate and drug problem. And the book has a foreword where he tells a little bit about his own personal life story. He basically says like, here's one chapter about my life and the rest of it is like serious policy discussion about solving America's drug problem. He shows it to his book publisher and they say, hey, this book is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> but if you take that first chapter and expand it to a whole book, people will like it. And he does it. So he drops all of the policy stuff and he turns the whole book into a narrative about his life and about struggle and upbringing. And he calls it Hillbilly Elegy. Hillbilly Elegy is a massive success because it hits around 2016 and basically is considered to like help explain why white working class voters are turning towards Trump. That the problems that are hollowing out the middle of America, drugs, opiates, etc. But he personally is not a fan of Trump. In fact, he compares himself to Barack Obama. He says he sees Barack Obama's struggle and upbringing and says it's like mine. Like J.D. Vance until 2021 is an entirely different person than the vice presidential candidate. He's like a guy that says like, you know, I'm only for working class people, I, whatever. He even said something that I think I've said on stream, which is to every complex problem, Trump offers a simple solution, but he never offers details for how these plans will work because he can't. His promises are the needle in America's collective vein. This is J.D. Vance 2016. This guy clearly has had a massive, massive, massive switch up. He said, Trump, I can't tell if he's a cynical asshole like Nixon, who wouldn't be that bad, or if he's America's Hitler. Then he has a switch up. This is uh, from an article called like the uh, radicalization of J.D. Vance. Basically, he realizes after Trump's win that there is no way he can gain power in the Republican Party without being pro-Trump. From his friends and associates that have talked to him, even David Frum, he realizes that he needs to, first of all, get a beard because his baby face looks terrible, becomes more religious, he becomes more radically pro-Trump. Trump himself says in 2021, around his time of his Senate seat, that J.D. Vance started kissing my ass. <laughs> That's Trump's words. Not surprisingly, he did rise the ranks with that and now is the vice president. But you have to understand that he is, from my POV, kind of a really spineless person who had like very deep written beliefs that he has changed radically at the same time as it's improved his standing. He also has things that I really am worried about, which is things like we need to be really ruthless when it comes to the exercise of power. That's a weird thing for a politician to say. I don't like that. He had interesting ideas about how Republicans could court the white working class without indulging in to toxic Trumpism. And then in 2021, he reinvented his entire persona overnight. He was way more against the woke. He was way more religious. He was way more pro-Trump and it worked. It worked. He gained a lot of power. He won the Senate seat and now he's VP. He also has this weird old tweet where he said, daylight savings time reduces fertility. <laughs> I don't know if he believes this still or not, but you know, he's just an odd guy. So I, there's not a lot to like here. All right, these are all things that I'm not like, I'm not super happy about. However, here's one thing I'll say. I'm just gonna, I, I, I wanna show all my sides here and I did a, some research for this. There are a number of people Trump could have picked for his VP and I probably would have hated all of them. 
But JD Vance of that group has a couple things that are interesting. And that is, there are people that dislike him that I dislike. <laughs> and so it makes, me, it makes him endearing on that front. And the people that dislike him are largely in big business because he has in the past, especially in his in like 2016 era, been extremely supportive of more economically populist things. Things like Bernie Sanders would support. Again, Republican outlets have called him a Bernie Sanders clone because he supports antitrust, breaking up big corporations. These are things that like he has supported, but I gotta have to temper this. This is like a, a, among a bad group of VP candidates. At least he has this rather than like, oh, this is great uh, because he also like I looked at his I looked at every bill he supported while he's in the Senate. He's only been in the Senate a few years. And there's like I can split them into thirds. One third of his bills I I actually like. They're like things that are about reigning in corporate power. Then he has another third that are like all about abortion. He's obsessed with policing women's right to abortion. That's like a third of his bills. And then the other third are like all random useless culture war bullshit, which is like, we're gonna make a anti-DEI day or whatever. That is his bills. So the first third is what I wanna say is at least interesting to me because I have resigned myself in a way to the fact that like, unless the, can the ticket changes, Biden is probably gonna lose. So I wanna talk about that. This is what crazy me. The craziest thing of all was that of everybody in the Republican Party, J.D. Vance said Lena Khan is one of the Biden administration officials doing a pretty good job. That to me is f crazy. He is the probably the only person, maybe outside of Josh Hawley, all special face, who said Lena Khan is doing a good job. So there is at least something there. There is at least something because that's, you know, I mean, Lena Khan is like demonized by even people on the Democratic side because she's attacking big business. My dream is that JD Vance is spineless and like Littlefinger. <laughs> And this is crazy. It's how low the bar is. That I am praying that JD Vance is spineless and power hungry to lie about his beliefs to get to the to office, but actually proposes stuff he used to care about, like a sleeper agent. <laughs> he yeah, he worked on a bipartisan deal to restrict bank mega mergers and stop bank CEO compensation from being raised after a bank fails. That's good policy. Like that is part of that third that I like. Possibly interesting. Okay. Also, people that are like extremely pro big business, no regulations are it, it against it. It sounds like heresy. Some of the, I do, the populism you're describing almost sounds like it's closer to progressivism. I also want to say, you know, someone's mentioning this in chat as well. I'm just showing the facts. I'm just showing some interesting things about J.D. Vance that I am learning. As VP, he has very little power over any of this, okay? Unless Trump dies. It's just interesting that he supports these things that almost traditionally no conservative would support. It's almost like you're saying the, the jury is in on trickle down and growing the pie through growth policy, uh, growth policies doesn't work anymore. It's so funny that he is arguing. You're saying the jury is in and that trickle down doesn't work? Yes. <laughs> yes. For a long time, bro. For a long time. Yes. The jury is in. It, it didn't work since the 80s. Again, this is legislation that Senator Whitehouse and Vance who are uh, opposite sides of the aisle, progressive Democrat, progressive Republican. They teamed up to attack big mergers. That's a good thing. I support that. J.D. Vance in 2021, right before his big pivot, I think, said raise taxes on top corporate leaders. He's questioned whether Google needs to have YouTube, whether Facebook needs to have Facebook or Instagram. Like these could be broken up. I don't think any of these will get through, but it's at least interesting that he supported them. And again, it reminds me of someone like Josh Hawley there's like this small cohort of new Republicans who like on social issues, I can't find any common ground, but at the very least they're like not with the old style of everything is about deregulation and helping top corporations. Josh Hawley had this thing where he was like grilling the Boeing CEO. What is it you get paid to do exactly? I get paid to run the Boeing company. So just help me understand that. I mean, do you get paid for transparency? Is that is that part of, is that one of the metrics? I think the board counts on me for transparency. Really? Because you're under investigation for falsifying 787 inspection <laughs> records. The Boeing's under criminal investigation for the Alaska Airlines flight. You were investigated by, GOD, by DOJ for criminal conspiracy to defraud the FAA. This is all. If this guy didn't immediately follow this by tweeting, we have to f ban abortions, which is a thing he's actually tweeted. It would be like, oh man, 
you're finally cooking. It's crazy. It's unfortunate. But yes, I, I agree uh, in this case. The finally grilling a CEO like this is nice to see. But what I want to say is traditionally, there's been this plan by the Republican Party for the longest time, which is that they tap in to these social issues, these divided social issues, while doing as little as possible to actually reduce incomes at the top. So it's like, they'll say whatever. And I, and I found some specific exact actual examples. I want to show you, but it's been the playbook forever, which is that like, we'll give and take on social issues while never giving and take on economic issues. So anyway, it's nice to see the beginnings, the seedlings of possible change, where we can get bipartisan agreement that, hey, maybe we can never agree on social issues, tragic, but. If we can't, at least we can agree that we're being ripped off constantly by big monopolies. So I want to give a specific example of a thing I think that like is possibly relevant to anyone here, okay, in America. There is this guy, Robbie Starbuck, a real freak. One of these real like deep in the wool weirdos. The war is a war on children. I fight, you know, kind of like what the boys might parody, okay? And this guy started a huge campaign to take down John Deere because their employees had like a LGBTQ rights club or whatever. Like this group of John Deere employees supported gay rights and had like a little parade, whatever. So he was like, I gotta take down John Deere. This is the biggest concern. So John Deere freaked out. This is recent. John Deere freaked out and said, you know what? We will no longer participate in any cultural awareness parades, festivals, or events. We will not have any socially motivated messages. We'll have no pronouns or, well, you know, John Deere freaked out because they're afraid of getting bud lighted, okay? But what you have to understand is what John Deere didn't freak out about, what John Deere didn't change. John Deere is happy if the Democrats are in power to allow LGBTQ rights and have a parade. And if they see the winds changing and Republicans are in power, they're happy to cut that away. Because at the end of the day, John Deere doesn't f care. They don't care either way. It's empty either way. They're only throwing the social thing back and forth so that you don't look at this. <laughs> the fact that their actual f consumers don't care about DEI policies or whatever. They care about the fact that they can't fix their tractors. John Deere is a monopoly on farm equipment that installs software on all of their tractors so that you can't fix it. Have to take it into a John Deere repair center that they overcharge you for. That's what they actually care about. They care about stopping right to repair. They can charge you three to six times more on parts and services because they install software that bricks your entire tractor if anything breaks and you cannot fix it yourself. And if you ever, if you're somebody who has crops due in the next you know few months, they might take months to repair your problem and then you can't afford to wait that long. John Deere is, is a detrimental monopoly to farmers, but we're tossing around this little social wedges you back and forth without ever changing that. By the way, I don't think they were ever woke. So Robbie Starbuck here is celebrating a huge win in our war on wokeness. I don't think John Deere was woke because they had to pay a million dollars this year for uh, racial discrimination. <laughs> They've never actually been woke, bro. They just throw little bones back and forth while they still try to milk money. And so if we can never attack these actual issues, the antitrust issues, if we keep focusing on uh, this bullshit and, and arguing about that, that is how we're not gonna make progress. They concentrate power, strip away the ownership rights of people to buy the products. People can't fix their own tractors. You have to wait weeks for otherwise thing. And what's crazy is they're also doing it. Again, they're, they're, they have this huge announcement about this. They don't mention at the same time, they're also firing American workers and shifting production to Mexico. They only care about maximal profits. If we don't target that issue, we will make no actual progress. And what's even crazy to me is if you try to Google it, if you try to look up anything on the John Deere monopoly, they've created a John Deere monopoly. So this is the result you get. <laughs> it's up, dude. This is just a quote I just like. I don't even know why I threw this in here, but it's a quote that it means a lot to me. It's from Roosevelt's Economic Bill of Rights speech, which basically says, true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Which is something I really, it's why I always come back to economics. It's why I, I hope that J.D. Vance can prove me wrong, that he's just, he's just simply a spineless guy that lied about liking Trump so he can actually make a change. I would like whatever it takes to get people to realize that no matter what side of the aisle you on, this stuff is bullshit until we get economic independence, until we get economic freedom, until we are freed from monopolies controlling almost every industry in our country and milking us and squeezing us for all of our extra money. That's what I'm saying, okay? That's what I, that's, that's what I wanted to bring up. And that's why it was interesting to me, though I think more than likely, he's just gonna be a huge rubber stamp on whatever Trump wants to do. And that's a little update on, on JD Vance. Listen. 
it's like impossible to not discuss this stuff as we come up on an election, a major pivotal election in America. <laughs> it's impossible. It's, it's just too relevant. And I think it's important. I think it's interesting. And I think I want to explain the reasons why I think the way I do and how I'm genuinely trying to look into what people have said and done.